So now it's a bit uh, cold in this room and I will contribute to make you shiver a little more with my lousy mouth, okay? So if you shriek, shriek loud, so I understand it's really wrong, okay? So today I'm gonna talk about actually a lot of, uh, I will hint at a lot of work and be a bit, go into more detail, especially about the study of noise-induced transitions between uh, multiple uh, uh, systems of having multiple uh, attractors and with specifically with application to climate. And uh, the first thing is the use of this melancholia word and the reason is actually because uh, the idea of this work came to me when I, wa I saw in 2011 the movie, by Mel melancholia movie by Lars von Trier and uh, last year surprisingly Barbie and London asked me to present the movie and talk about some of the work I'm gonna talk about today which is something that I should be very technically very proud of and actually it was a lot of fun and uh, before I start I want to acknowledge that in this very place in this very room it was now 11 years ago there was a workshop organized by very some of the people in this room or contributing here with a lot of participants who actually are here also this time and this was very important for me to start an entire set of research lines. So I'm very grateful to this place. I'm sure, I hope it will inspire other people. Marco also was there. That's when I met for the first time a lot of people and especially acknowledge uh, Carlangelo and others, uh, the kind uh, invitation, help and support by Sandro Vienti, whom I met in this way. He told me I am a guy who knows a lot about, uh, knows a little about mathematics and a lot about TV series. Do we wanna be friends? That's the start, that's Sandro Vienti. So it's become my hero, in fact. Now, so, and this is actually in the website of Carlangelo, I think, or anyway, it's in somewhere in Rome. Now, uh, color coding uh, now to, for this presentation, I will not use uh, uh, blackboard, their official excuse is because I need colors and it's very hard to use colors in the blackboard. In fact, I, I'm, uh, I need to show images and I will try anyway to be as specific as possible. The starting point, the starting point is a very general problem, something I've been thinking about since actually I started science at all. So the problem of studying the response of the system to perturbation, of course, uh, just had a fantastic lecture on that. And I will briefly touch on the same topic because of course we have overlapping interest with Viviana. She also mentioned, if we look at the problem conceptually, the problem of studying responsive system to perturbation is very general in almost any area of science you can think of. Some of the keywords that people in various areas in their own languages mention are the sensitivity of the system, the robustness of the system, which has a lot of very technical meanings of course, whether we can establish uh, some uh, formulas and some theories supporting the formulas for mutual response or whether we go through critical transitions. And today we're gonna talk mostly about the last part. So in fact, uh, here, if, we, if you're a physicist like I am, I was the, uh, uh, you know, as uh, Viviane was saying before, so that when you think about response theory, the first name uh, you discover in your, when you study is the name of Kubo in 1957. He wrote a very, very remarkable paper in a very, very unremarkable journal, and uh, which actually has, has given an enormous contribution to science. Amazing story uh, is, you know, the kind of story many physicists like is that uh, the paper is uh, mathematically not rigorous and also physically in some sense totally wrong, but it works perfectly. That's actually amazing. It's mathematically not rigorous because there is no mathematical hypothesis over the system where response theory is established. It's physically wrong because there is no such a thing as thermostat in the system. So the system are, can explode in terms of thermodynamically and you don't want to offend Giovanni Galavotti not thinking about thermostat. So then, but the, the key element that uh, Vivian mentioned is that this one of the little pieces of the theory is the fluctuation dissipation theorem but there is much more, which is the old theory of linear response. And if you go much fast forward in time, I don't need to, there are, this, this has been made much more rigorous, of course, and has made re, real, if you want, uh, by Ruel uh, in the 90s, 
And uh, I would add also as a reference on a different approach, if you consider stochastic system, things are much easier uh, in, in some sense. And Eirer and Maida wrote a, a, a linear response theory for stochastic system. And uh, uh, there, uh, I will not repeat the results mentioned by already by Vivian in, 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 uh, in uh, through the modern approach based on transfer operator theory. So this is the region that the, what, what you know when we hope to have smooth response to perturbation. If we go to the opposite uh, case, to the opposite uh, regime of response, we talk about critical transition. It's a totally different, of course, context. We look at qualitative change in the properties of a system to perturbations and uh, some sort of eye catching word is the catastrophe theory, something that in the 60s was, of course, is seen as an all a, a sort of theory of systems in general. I mean, if we go a bit down and think, uh, of course, uh, uh, we look, a, a good way to look at critical transition, that's a word, kind of word that's become very popular, is in fact a good old classic bifurcation theory with all its variants, including recent contribution by, as an example, Ashwin and others that have studied bifurcations where they do not depend only on the value of the parameter of a system, but also on the rate of change of the parameter of a system. And in a, if in a, in a different context, we want to keep in mind the uh, classic friedling benson theory of escape from attractors. This will become very relevant. And uh, we will see exactly application of this. Now, I decided, for reasons uh, are not entirely clear, at a certain point to choose as my natural system of reference the climate system. In fact, uh, for, uh, it's an amazing area of study, uh, well beyond what uh, it becomes, might be sometimes more popularized. But the nice thing is that the problem of climate response to perturbation and also relationship between climate response and variability touches the directly three of the most important scientific problems in general, that we face today. One is the anthropogenic climate change. Somehow, more importantly, is the relationship between the evolution of paleoclimate and life. And even more important, in some sense, is the how life, in some more abstract sense, can exist at all in the universe. And this is a huge area of work. And nicely enough, for, uh, for our fetish for response, climate shows clearly in the data and models uh, in your dreams, uh, all the range of response, from the smooth response to the critical transition to what's in between. We will see also what is in between. So since this is uh, maybe not the audience that is uh, always used to looking at the climate, when we talk about the climate system, to be a bit more specific, I mean, at a phenomenological level, we look at a system that's composed by five subsystems, the atmosphere, Hydrosphere, so water and the likes, cryosphere, ice and the likes, biosphere, worms, humans and the likes, and soil, where in fact both worms and humans live. And uh, uh, these systems interact in a very complex way and they are characterized by very different and very vast range of scales of interaction in space and time. So remember that the time scales of the cryosphere, of the ice, and thinking about Greenland or Antarctic ice sheets, is a much, much longer than the time scale of the atmosphere, which is order of one year or something like that. So depending on your time scale of interest, climate is something very different. And where the active and passive part are different. So now let's go back to a more conceptual uh, view of the problem of climate that might appeal for those of you who are more versed into non-equilibrium statistical mechanics. So this is taken from one of the books of uh, Giovanni Galavotti. That's a sort of prototype of non-equilibrium system. A non-equilibrium system is a system in contact with at least two reservoirs at different temperature or chemical potential. And this non-equilibrium steady state is established when we let the system start a lot of transient, complex transient behavior goes on, and then there is a, a balance between fluxes in the system, and we go to non-equilibrium conditions with contraction of phase space and any of this amazing stuff. If we look at climate, the, actually it's a very good example of this huh, on with the phenomenology that's clear to us. Non-equilibrium is given by unequal absorption of uh, solar radiation at low latitudes rather than high latitudes. And 
more absorption of solar radiation at surface than aloft. So the entirety of uh, the motions of geophysical fluids and of energy tra transports are due to this uh, inhomogeneous absorption, okay? So if you think about large scale atmospheric transport, it has to do with this unequal north-south gradient, and all the motion of convection and heat exchange in the vertical are due to that. So we have actually a perfect example on an equilibrium, and uh, all the complex phenomenologies you can be seen in these abstract terms. One can also see the system at the higher level, of course, graining, as a very good example of a non-equilibrium thermodynamical system with uh, all the machinery of the non-equilibrium thermodynamics. As I was saying, and this is something I would like to stress, since uh, this system has astrophysical range of motions in the sense that uh, spatial and time scales uh, of variability cover a range of 10 or 15 orders of magnitude, there is no numerical model that covers all of it. So keep in mind, when you hear about a, a mo climate model, you have a model that describes explicitly a relatively small range of scale, and the other scales are either parametrized or kept uh, as a boundary condition, okay? D different classes of model, weather prediction, regional weather prediction versus global climate model make different choices, okay? So that's important to keep in mind. For those of you who want to have uh, some uh, more, let's say, idea of the, re let's say, area of interaction between maths and physics and climate, there is, as an example, this paper. So now, let's uh, go into the direction so something, I, I, this, I'm not a fan of uh, this class of problem, but it's something that's become very important. So up to now, people have been talking about climate change. Last year, or this year, uh, something quite extraordinary in the sad context of contemporary press has happened. That The Guardian has written a nice piece where they explain why they have changed in the language they use in describing climate. They're not using anymore the expression climate change, they use the expression climate crisis. This is actually extremely non-trivial to reflect on language, okay? And there is something, in fact, relevant. So we don't, when we talk about climate change, people tend to think about smooth changes. When we think about climate crisis, it, it gives the sense that the, the, something big can change, okay? So does this make sense? Surprisingly, yes. It's actually extremely accurate. Okay, the one can, as I said, one can find, and that's what uh, we've done and others have done, of course, and I've talked a bit about this story, that there are different regimes of forcing, regimes of response that you find in climate data as well as in climate models. So to use that kind of language, surprisingly, it's extremely accurate and it's a good improvement in the way we talk about science. So. There is a regime where we can use, almost by the book, but believing a lot in paradise, as Vivian was, if you, if you believe a lot in paradise, I'm not big on these sort of things, but if you believe a lot in paradise, you can use re smooth response theory to predict climate change, and it works, okay? Now, if you believe in paradise, but that if you don't behave very well, you can get uh, close you know, at least to purgatory, then depends on your sect of reference. Well, if you get uh, in a region where the spectral gap is small of your transfer operator, the response theory start to wobble, okay? And this has to do with slow decay of correlation in your system, and you see this happening. And then the last part is when you face the critical transitions. Okay, so rigor of this, and that's the shiver moment I'm giving you, there is no rigor in the sense that this is, uh, this is uh, a way in the sense that you have to take some working hypothesis, of course, because uh, it's uh, unthinkable to use a top-down approach in general of a numerical model which has an infinite level of dirtiness inside. So if you want to believe that you can make a theory at all, you have to believe that there is a link between the mathematics you use and the physics or the numerics you're looking at. So what is extremely useful here is to take the chaotic hypothesis of Galavotti coin and say that if your system is very chaotic, very high dimensional, dirty enough, somehow a lot, it will look a lot like uniformly hyperbolic. And this is not entirely true, and I mean, I have uh, work where I studied deviations from this. 
explicit, but it works in a lot of contexts, including this one. So now, the tool we use, so the tool, most of the results I will talk about are not done with a simple model, but are done with a model that actually for climate science is a simple model because it has only 10 to the five degrees of freedom. Because the current state of the art IPCC class climate models have 10 to the eight, 10 to the nine degrees of freedom. Still, this is a relatively complete climate model that you can run nowadays in a laptop like this, which corresponds 20 years ago to a supercomputer, of course, okay? So this is a, a sort of a, a climate model that gives you a real, uh, I mean, a good idea of the main processes, and just to give you a number, in standard condition will give you uh, you know, something like, I don't know, 200, 500, 1,000 positively up and over exponents. So very well developed turbulence, okay? Reasonable weather and so on. So this is an open access model that you can install and is due to my predecessors in Hamburg. So, so this is 1,000 up to exponents over 10 to 5? Yes, degrees. yeah, because you have a dissipation, of course. Of, See, of course, this is a lot of dissipation going on. That's an, any, and not only uh, with Laplacian, but with powers of Laplacian and so on to stabilize. So you have to think it's, it has a relatively low number, low, I mean, the relative kaplan york dimension is small, but it is large in absolute terms, okay? So that's to give you a sense. Okay, now this is uh, in uh, the paradise part of the world. So we used by the book, and I will not refer all the kind, I mean, this is written in a sort of brutal, probably, thing. But we constructed somehow the time-dependent measure of the climate using the time-dependent, so non exactly rigorous, a version of the well response theory, and we construct our observables, general observables change in time, giving a background state. We constructed the response operator, linear, resp linear green function, the linear susceptibility. Uh, you can look at the uh, holomorphic properties of the linear susceptibility, Kramer's chronic relation work, and uh, in some sense, God is good, and you're able to, to relate forcings to the response of the system. So you oh, are able, yeah, 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 but this is, this is, uh, these are not, you don't have to think the detail. These are changes in the CO2 concentration, so the for, you can relate forcings, but it can be any forcing to the climate. So non-time, time dependent ch uh, forcing to the autonomous dynamics to the response of a general observable, okay? And what are these different These are different uh, scenarios. So there are diff these are the classic, uh, uh, some of the classic. Uh, are uh, the same, uh, no, no, one second. So uh, if, you if you tell me a path of increase of CO2, okay. I can, okay, I'm able to, con what I can do is the following. I construct the green function of giving, uh, corresponding to uh, the uh, impact of increase on CO2 on an observable of your interest. Okay, temperature over Western Europe, uh, it uh, uptake by the ocean there. I am uh, therefore, if you give me a path of increase of CO2, I'm able to tell you the response of any observable. So in that sense, I'm, I'm solving the problem of climate change, okay, in some sense in a weak sense because it's a, in an ensemble sense. It's not a, the trajectory, of course. Let's keep in mind, there is always this problem. Okay, so this. No, no, this is, no. These are different scenarios of forcing. So this is CO2, CO2, CO2 concentration. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And these are, I'm just showing you a, 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 a cartoon taken from the IPCC report that given scenarios, different scenarios of forcing, models give you different responses. The idea is that if you use response theory, these become obsolete in the sense that once you have the green function, you can translate, you know, the green function is a black box, you throw a forcing and it gives you the response. So this is the power of response theory that actually does work. So a nice thing, you know, sometimes you have to take care of spherical cows. So the problem, one of the things of the spherical cows here is that if you take a, a system with a singular measure contractive phase space, there is the problem of applicability of fluctuation dissipation theorem that Vivian in different way was hinting at, and uh, it has to do with that integration by part. So the problem is, 
if uh, you have a singular measure, there is no dictionary relating forced uh, uh, free fluctuations of the system to forced response, as opposed to equilibrium systems. So the, in other terms, you find that climate response and climate variability are two different, slightly different problems, because you can't apply by the book, The Fluctuation Dissipation Theorem. And in this paper with my friend and colleague, Andre Gritsun, we found a case of force variability that had nothing to do with the natural variability because it's associated to what? To a totally ephemeral, strange, unstable periodic orbit of the system that uh, has no weight in the invariant measure, okay? So, that, that's a, so you can find this sort of sophisticated structure even in high dimensional model. Now let's get closer to hell, and uh, what happens when uh, you get uh, your, uh, uh, you have a system and you know, phenomenological, you're close to a critical transition. Is there some signature of closure of uh, the spectral graph in the transfer operator in some possibly well-defined functional space? And the answer is yes. So this is a paper where the main contribution come from Alexi Tante, a former student of Enk Dijkstra. We took, you know, that kind of very high dimension climate model. We try to study the evolution of densities. In, uh, and uh, indeed, we found that at the, at the critical transition, so when the system goes, collapses from one state to another state, so the linear response breaks down, you find that the, uh, transfer, the uh, spectral gap in some reduced space, and so there are lots of aspects there, goes to zero. So you can really find the, the, some of response theory telling you I'm not working anymore, okay? And so, of course, there is a much of, uh, you cannot be totally rigorous because it's impossible, it's very hard to make this clean, but you see evidence of this deep mathematical structure also at this level, which I find it quite fascinating. Now, we go to the main, so I wanted to tell you that there is a continuity between smooth response, the response doesn't work anymore, the system wobbles and it literal wobbles, and this is the slow decay of correlation you get near when the transfer of the, the spectral gap closes, and now you go to the critical transition. So let me introduce you this, this sort of terminology that has become extremely popular in earth science, the terminology of tipping elements and uh, tipping points. So tipping points, you can think bifurcation points. But this has become now the sort of uh, uh, what uh, some linguists will call plastic words, a, a sort of something that sounds cool and good, whatever this means. So tipping elements was introduced in this uh, publication by Lenton et al, sorry, the Ellis Cut. It's a, it's a paper that I entirely dislike for many, it's really a wrong paper, misleading, everything, but it has uh, the merit, as often, unfortunately, paper who open something are really bad and uh, 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 at least that's how I see it. But it, it introduced, introduced the problem of studying what they call the highly sensitive region to climate change. So somehow you have climate change, but there is a very strongly nonlinear response. It's, all of this is very badly formulated here, and in some sense you can get irreversible changes if you, if you push it too hard. And uh, there are some regions that are identified, so there is the dieback of the Amazon forest, the uh, uh, basically permafrost releasing methane, the uh, uh, fundamental changes in the structure of the Indian monsoon. So these are fundamental problem of uh, today, in fact, uh, climate. And uh, okay, so we will, uh, we, uh, this is sort of how this problem, became, this class of problems became relevant in earth science. And tip types is a European project I'm part of the starting, and we are very critical compared to this. So anyway, uh, again, let's give a qualitative cartoon. What is a tipping point? I mean, something like this, I have a forcing which is finite, or at least uh, I'm in the wrong place, and uh, I have uh, a changeover of the properties of the system. So I go across a bifurcation. This is a really, uh, is on purpose actually very rough, the way it's defined. And uh, let's make example, once the Amazon forest is lost, because you have gone beyond a certain level of forcing, it is lost. If you, if you reduce the emissions, it's not gonna grow back. 
okay? And once you are outside of the European Union, you are outside the European Union. And of course, I mean, uh, th this is actually a social um, tipping point. People studying this very, very seriously. And uh, yeah, uh, so now let's try to give, uh, uh, to go back to some uh, qualitative uh, uh, but extremely informative view on the problem. So what is the typical situation you have uh, in many systems is something like that. So you have a parameter of con a control, uh, you have a parameter here on the x-axis and you have a variable of interest, income of Carlangelo Liberani on the y-axis, okay? And then you have a region of bistability where there are two possible states which coexist and there is uh, a tipping point which is basically the end region of the bistability and then you have in between an unstable state. So this is sort of really very, very simple bifurcation theory. A simple a setting which is almost trivial, but this is actually how people look at even very, very complex systems. So that's not how I'm gonna look at it, but this is the, the frame of reference that's often used to study uh, transition between competing. So now we focus on this region, where we have multi-stability, and depending on the history of your system, if it's deterministic dynamics, depending on which basin of the attraction you are in at time zero, either you end up in state A or state B with probability one. With pro but there is a little bit of, there is a, you can be in state C with probability zero, but you can be in state C, of course. We will see, actually, this becomes very relevant. So how, what is the standard way to look at this problem, even for very complex system, and there are millions of publications like this, you take an observable, you, you have, uh, you construct the Langevin equation, in, so this is just a scalar problem, you construct the Langevin equation with a pseudo, with a potential and noise, you have an invariant measure which of course has, if the, if the potential has uh, two, uh, minima, the uh, probability density will have two maxima, and then you study the average transition time between uh, state A and state B, or state B and state A, using uh, uh, the classic Kramer's result in the, in the zero noise limit. Of course, if you look at Friedli and Wenzel, this becomes an entire universe, okay? But this is the simple picture. Okay, and so this is A is Brexit, B is no Brexit and C is the negotiation, okay? Which in fact goes on forever. So you see, you can stay there for a very long time. Okay, so this is the sort of uh, standard way to look at the problem. Now I go into the specific problem I, I'm talking about today and we will use uh, a different, uh, different tools. So since we are very modest, uh, we look the idea is to look at the, probably the most important uh, problem in earth sciences. So our planet is, for those of you who are not entirely aware of it, it's actually multi-stable. So now we are in this stable state uh, B, but given the current astronomical and astrophysical condition, we could be in state A, which is the state of total ice cover of the planet and temperature of about minus 60 Celsius or 220 Kelvin, and in fact, uh, uh, we have been in state A about 600 million years ago for many millions of years, and we have done flip-flop from A to B. So this is very real, okay? And one could say, who cares? People care because in the 60s, when people were you know, thinking about nuclear warfare, and uh, they said, you know, what happens if we bomb the earth? You know, we all die, whatever, but you know, if you stay underground, you wait long enough, maybe we can survive. Indeed, if you cover the sun, incoming solar radiation, for long enough, you're gonna jump from B to A, and then uh, you're done. So this was studied in the 60s by Budico and Sellers, which, oh, as the last name suggests, belong to the two sides of the blocks at the time, and they published in the same year a paper indicating this problem, which I find it interesting. Michael Gill extended the analysis in the 70s, and people thought, oh, these are the usual theoreticians finding useless results, and in the 90s, the evidence came that this is real, okay? So how can we represent this? We can go back to the sort of silly mathematics I showed you before, and then build on that. So we have a simple energy balance model. The left-hand side is energy 
budget of a system C is a heat capacity, I is the incoming uh, energy, O is the outgoing, I is the solar irradiance times a factor which has to do with the albedo, so how much solar radiation is reflected. So people use this word, parametrized the albedo as a function of the temperature. So if the temperature is high, the blue planet, the planet is blue because it absorbs everything. Whereas uh, the uh, uh, poles, or the, the Antarctica is whitish because it reflects everything, so this alpha is large. And there is a transition there. Now, what is the, what are called, uh, people like to call them the feedbacks of the system. Actually, I'm having some fun in, you know, using this very sort of uh, sluggish terminology here because this is uh, the way most people look at this problem and it's good to communicate this. So the, the, the system undergoes two main feedbacks. One is a negative feedback, so a stabilizing one. You can think it in terms of control, of course. And a warmer body emits more radiation as a fundamental law of thermodynamics, and so it cools down. So this is a negative feedback, which has to do with this uh, outgoing term, which is monotonic with T. And then there is uh, the positive feedback as associated to ice albedo feedback. If a planet gets warmer, it loses ice, it absorbs more radiation, and it gets even warmer. So what we get here, and this is the work of the 60s in fact, we get to that in some uh, reasonable parameter range we get three solutions, a snowball solution, warm solution, and unstable solution in between. Okay, so this becomes now our bistability, well, our phase diagram, warm state, snowball state, unstable state, and in fact, this is, uh, the tipping points are technically associated to boundary crisis. So what happens that at the tipping point, the snowball state, that tipping point, snowball state, unstable state, shake hands, and they both disappear, okay? That, that's what happens. So the, 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 the basin of attraction, the, sorry, the basin, basin of attraction touches the unstable state, and they both disappear, okay? Now, is this, how is, re is this real for uh, this very complex, uh, model I was mentioning you before. In fact, you construct this a PhD thesis of Robert Boschev, student, former student of mine. You find region in this, uh, in some, this is a uh, surface temperature versus uh, incoming solar radiation and CO2 concentration, and you find this bistability, and you find in this very complex system the regions where the measure is differentiable, the region where you have uh, uh, the, tr the uh, transfer operator uh, the gap of the transfer operator goes to zero. And now we have multi-stability, but this is not a one-dimensional system. What is in between uh, that state and this state? What is there? Is there an in-between? I mean, you can also make it. Yeah. So this picture comes from the simplified model that you just talked about, or the real model? No, no, this is a very 10 to the five degrees of range. So these are many hundreds each. Many hundreds of simulations where we constructed the true phase portrait of climate in some set, true phase portrait, whatever this means. So this means that the simplified model is actually good. Yes, yeah, this is the idea because these are very, so there is a struct, there is a stability across model hierarchy of what I discussed until now. So just to show you, this appears in very complex model where you have weather, cyclones, storms, and anything. But now the question is, I have that attractor there, which is very high dimensional. I have this other attractor, which is very high dimensional. I must have two basins of attraction for these two attractors. It, what is? Can I define the in-between? What lies in between? What is, is there something that corresponds to the unstable state? Okay? And now, the help comes from uh, uh, the, some literature in dynamical system in the 80s by Greboji, Ott, and York who discussed, uh, introduced this concept of edge state. And uh, so the idea is that assume you have two basins of attra two, two attractors, omega one and omega two, you have say contractive dynamics, you have a basin bound, you have basin, bound, uh, bound, basin of attraction B1 of omega one, B2 of omega two, you must have uh, a basin boundary, okay? Now if you start uh, in the basin boundary, what happens? And the idea is that if you start in the basin boundary, you end up in 
an object, which is a subset of the Bayesian boundary, which is the edge state. So the edge state, so and uh, if you think in terms of separation of scale, if you start very, very close to the Bayesian boundary, what will happen is that you first follow the Bayesian boundary, get close to the edge state, and then push either to this or to the other attractor, depending where you start. So that object is the equivalent of the saddle I described before. And this is dynamically much more general. So let's, uh, so that's the beauty of doing something like climate is that uh, you transform this into a picture with colors, okay? So now this is the snowball state, this is the warm state, and this is the melancholia state. Now, an interesting thing is that uh, conceptually, near this basin boundary, and particularly near the melancholia state, you have loss of what is called predictability of the second kind. That is, small changes in your initial state will, can lead you to very different final state. And this is a concept that Ed Lorenz himself introduced in the 70s. So now, in this, uh, yeah. In, the, in this paper with Tamash Bodai, we tried to approach the problem of constructing these uh, extremely evil, devilish uh, states, which are very unstable, for a full climate model. Is it possible? This had been done before for uh, simple maps or for some fluid configuration by Bruno Eckert in a set of fantastic papers, by the way. So now we took a, that climate model that to make simple, let's say with some simplifications, but very, uh, very non-relevant. And this model, just to give you some equations, the atmosphere is described by primitive equations, so this Navier-Stokes and rotating frame of reference with some approximation on vertical motion. This is coupled, so this is a full fluid dynamics, uh, coupled to a reaction diffusion two-dimensional equation describing the transport of the ocean. So this is, uh, as I said, the, the atmosphere is fast, very turbulent, the ocean is diffusive and slow things down, okay? And does uh, corresponds to the slow dynamics of my system, okay? And you can make this as formal as you want. Here, I'm just trying to give you the, the sense of it. Now, the question is, how do you get uh, this melancholia state? And this is uh, uh, the intuition by Bruno Eckhart, actually, in this was incredible. It's actually pretty simple. Let's start, take two initial conditions in the two basins of attraction. Now you take anything that's equivalent to a line, not necessarily a straight line, and by bisection, you find the two initial conditions as close as you wish, such that one goes to the warm state and one goes to the cold state. Now, let's, say, let's assume you have these two initial conditions. At distance epsilon one, you start these two trajectory, and when they are separated more than epsilon two, you, you do again the bisection, and you continue, so you shadow a trajectory on the Bayesian boundary, and if you're lucky enough, you end up in this asymptotic state, and the fact is, you end up in this asymptotic state, in this unstable state in 10 to the five dimensions. You find it, and you populate it, and it is, in fact, a chaotic set with uh, positive, uh, with non-trivial dynamics that I will show you in a moment. But before I show you this, a nice uh, property we found of the Bayesian boundary. So here, since I was a bit, uh, uh, let's say, naive, I represented it as a manifold, so an object of co-dimension one. So you think, okay, I have, say, 10 to the five uh, degrees of freedom. This is an object of, uh, uh, of dimension 9999, okay? That's at least it is of dimension 9999, but it could have could dimension smaller than one. In fact, in the results of uh, uh, York and company, they showed in, in a two-dimensional map, rigorously, that uh, if uh, this edge state is chaotic and the first, uh, the Lyapunov exponent, the first Lyapunov exponent in their case, is larger than the inverse of the decay time, Okay, that uh, tells you how much mass is lost if you start near the edge, near this edge state being pushed either to this snowball or to the worm. Then you expect that uh, the co-dimension of this set is uh, smaller than one. So I would have never bet that in this i dimension I could see this. So this is. Uh, these are two initial conditions which are very close to each other across the, two, the boundary. 
Now I take 1,000 initial conditions that are almost indistinguishable from each other, and then I do, uh, I send forward the 1,000 initial conditions, and one means that they go to the warm state, and zero means that they go to the cold state. So what you find is that this Vedian boundary is a fractal set, and the co-dimension we can, could estimate here. We didn't, we're not interested in doing a very fine estimate, but the, it's, it, it has a fractal structure, so it's not a manifold. It is a, a, co, it is a fractal object, and the co-dimension is something like 0.02, meaning that Near the Bayesian boundary, there is a gray zone, almost of full measure, where if you, if you put, if some evil Mayan divinity puts you there, you don't know where you're gonna end up, okay? That's actually quite amazing. And you, you can construct now a full face portrait of this high dimension climate system. You have the warm state, you have the cold state, and then you construct this chaotic Melancholia state. And then strange things happen with that we have not explored yet. In a certain parametric range, this uh, melancholia state, this system is uh, zonally symmetric in terms of boundary conditions. Symmetry is broken. Some uh, strange uh, large scale wave is formed that we have not fully understood. Anyway, it's a symmetry break phenomenon. And in a parametric window, we found a third climate. Okay? So there is not only two climate states in a small parametric window. There are three climates. And this is something that has been found by much more complex, more complex climate models. So in, the idea is the, the global face portrait of the climate system can be much more complex, much richer than we think. And this has enormous implication on what can happen when, when we add noise, okay? If we add noise, we can start to jump. Because up to now, this is a static image. I have this, Different uh, attractors, even different basin boundary. But if, I, if, if it's a deterministic dynamics, I, I end up where I'm bound to. Okay? And so when you're saying that we are in the warm state, it's not really the warm state. We are somewhere close to the warm No, no, we are, we are no, no, we are. The, the idea is that now, the, the question is that how many are, the, for the present conditions, the competing climate states? At least two, this for sure, but there could be more. And it depends, in fact, people who are using uh, better models of the ocean find a different configuration. And this has implication because if you look at planets in other systems, they could uh, be in what is called the habitable zone, so the condition where you can have water, but if they are in another state, they could be totally unable to support life. And that could, be could have been planets that were in something like the warm state, then something happens, which could be a geologic activity, an asteroid, whatever, the Mayan divinity which, that woke up in bad mood and is put in, in a bad state and everything is gone. So that's, a f it's, I, I don't know, I find it very fascinating. So just to show you briefly how, if this works, uh, yeah. So this is, uh, these are three initial conditions and uh, uh, so this is, uh, will go to the cold state, edge state, and warm state. I, I will move to the end just to show you and focus on the central part, the edge state. So the warm state is pretty much how climate is nowadays. The edge state, you see that there are these sort of uh, 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 thicker blue line. And these are closed, uh, these are called cutoff laws. So this is the edge state as weather, it's not very dissimilar from what we have. So if you, if you were in the edge state, assume you are now near the edge state, you would see for a while cyclones, snow, good weather, whatever, and you will then slowly drift on a climatic time scale of years, either to there or to there, okay? So that there is a time scale separation. So in this case, the time scale separation that York Discussed is very real. It's weather versus climate time scales, or atmosphere versus ocean time scale. Okay. Now, I will skip this and go to the final part. So now, we are, the message is the global phase portrait of climate is very non-trivial, and nicely we can explore it using some uh, non-entirely trivial ideas of dynamical systems without giving up detail we can look at the problem in very high dimensions. So this is, this is the thing I really like the most. Now, can I still retain something of this in some sense? 
So now what we did is, we take all the equations I've shown you before, and we add noise, white noise, note, in the incoming solar radiation. Given the equations, this is a multiplicative noise. So we are really bad with ourselves. We don't put additive noise in the system, we put multiplicative noise, which makes it a bit harder. Still, this system, now this system corresponds to a planet in front of a star where the, the outgoing radiation fluctuates, which is of course what stars do. Okay, so this is actually very physical noise. Okay, what happens now? So this is a report in a recent paper on physical review letters, and there is a longer paper in review on linearity where this is done in much greater detail. So now, how we look at the problem, we take, uh, uh, now our problem has become, of course, uh, I'm, I've been very sloppy, this is a field, this is a PD, but everything becomes uh, ODEs in our world because everything is projected in some modes or in grid points. But now, in, when I had noise, my original system that uh, to which I applied the response theory and so on, gets on the right hand side a nasty noise term uh, with a non-trivial but known uh, um, basically a, a diffusion term. Now, now we have to make some hypothesis, and we assume that this is a hyperlytic diffusion process, which means that the noise, whatever it comes from, propagates to a degrees of freedom in some sense, and this is technically stated imposing so-called Hormander condition between the drift and the uh, volatility term. So note that, again, in this case, physics is very nice to us, because this means that the fluctuations in the solar energy impact all degrees of freedom, all degrees of, freedom of the system. Of course this happens, because the sun drives everything, like technically. Remember the non-equilibrium picture I showed you before. So this is, we are very safe in this case, in this system, we know that this, this hypothesis makes sense. It's not just an hypothesis we need to go forward, okay? So that's a, a nice case. So now, we can write, what is the idea? Is that uh, we can write the invariant measure as a large deviation law, where we can introduce a pseudo-potential, or quasi-potential, how you want to call it, which is phi, and then divided by sigma squared, which is the factor in front of our noise. So in, the, in our case, it will be a controllable parameter, which is the fractional variability of the solar radiation. So it's something very real that we can change in our model. So now we are here, and uh, of course, in the, in the case of energy, of energy landscape, this is just the potential. But this, let's assume, now the idea is this, let's assume that the invariant measure of our system, stochastically perturbed system, looks like this. What can we draw from here? So we can, we, we can have, uh, we, we, we have a lot of things happening. So the first thing we have is that in the weak noise limit, the noise induced escapes go through special paths, which are instantons, and these instantons, which are minimizer of the action, of the action, connect the attractor to the edge state. So how is the noise induced transition? I am near the attractor. I'm so unlucky that the noise pushes me uphill, in some, where hill is the pseudo potential, to the edge state. Now I'm near the edge state. The pot, not, not that the pseudo potential is flat, it's constant on the attractor and the edge state. I'm in a 50-50 situation, I, I get the wrong kick and I go there. So this is the Friedlin Wenzel scenario, but also with the, this more complex dynamical uh, landscape uh, for the deterministic case. Here, the edge state and the attractors are not trivial set. Actually, they are sort of big sets. So the instanton is not unique because there is no, it costs nothing to move on the attractor, okay? Now, the distribution of escape, escape, escape times is an exponential. This is a Poisson process. And uh, the average transition time should be proportional to the exponent of the difference, twice the difference between the pseudo potential in the edge state minus the pseudo potential in the attractor divided by sigma square. Okay. Now, do you believe that it's, I mean, okay, you have to believe in this. Now we take this model and we study three cases. 
one close to this edge, uh, to this tipping point, one in between, actually corresponding to present day conditions, and one for a warmer climate. So the first result is that you can construct the, in this very high dimensional model, you can construct actually the difference between the pseudo potential of the edge state and the attractor. So yes, this thing works and you can construct this, uh, the large deviation laws as slope of the average transition times for different value of noise. So you, you see the correct scaling behavior and you're able to reconstruct this very non-trivial probabilistic object in this high dimensional set. So there is no simplification here. Now, if you project the measure, so if you project the escapes in a two dimension. Very short, did I see correct that the others are bigger or even less? Yes, yes, these are very, yeah, they, so basically, yes, yes, this is, yes, so in the sense that it's, you, of course this is, you know, we have done all of this in low tech, no high performance computing, so, but the idea is that even if it's not ultra weak, you, you see the scaling behavior, okay? Now you can be interested more into this direction, of course. It becomes more realistic and the theory works less, better, the more you go on this side when the noise is weak. Yes, but how much is the noise? No, no, this is, okay, this is the noise. So the noise, the reference noise we use is something like one or two percent on a scale of 100 years, which is very large compared to the actual activity of the sun, say. No, no, it's much stronger than what the sun gives. So it's not, it's not realistic for our specific problem or we would have jumped in and out very, very often, okay? So now, let me go to this. Now, because it's more interesting, we take, uh, our reference state. So this is uh, the current climate conditions. I have noise. So the black, the red dot is the current attractor projected in the face in two dimension only. Temperature difference between equator and pole and average temperature. So this is really going to a very reduced dimension. So the graph you see it's in logarithmic scale is the measure is the projected density of uh, this very complex measure. Note that it's uh, logarithmic, so actually this thing is very thin and high, okay? It's not too broad. Now, we, we have estimated, so we know what is the warm attractor, we know what is the cold attractor, we know where is the edge state, previous paper, and now we construct the uh, instantons just by stochastic averaging, and indeed the instanton link the attractor to the edge states. So this works, somehow. And uh, these are the projection of the probability density in one dimension along uh, uh, up there for surface temperature and here for temperature difference. So you have the maxima, the local maxima at the attractors where, of course, uh, you have a local minima of the pseudo potential and the local minimum at uh, the edge state where you have the local maximum of the pseudo potential. I will skip this and uh, come, go to the end so we, we can study the symmetry break. So now assume we believe that this is the invariant measure for a given value of sigma. What you expect is let's send sigma to zero. And we are in the region of, multi of bistability, so we have two local minima of uh, phi. Now if sigma goes to zero, one of the two local minima will become, the, the, the one with the lower value, will become dominant. So the measure should concentrate there and not on the other one. So the, can we see this? And uh, of course you have to keep in mind that uh, since also the transition time goes to infinity, you are at risk of being trapped in the non-asymptotic. Each individual trajectory is at risk of being trapped in the non-asymptotic piece of the measure for a very long time. So now let's make this, uh, let's now find the final, the closure of this, the relationship between uh, the deterministic phase portrait of the system and what we see, what, really, when we have noise. So this is the bistability diagram I'm showing you for the third or fourth time. Cold attractor, melancholia state, warm attractor, forget about this stuff here. Let's focus on the red, green, and the blue line. So now I do 
for each value of uh, this parameter, which is one for the present climate, colder and warmer, I run many a long simulation with a certain value of noise. And I do the P I plot the PDF of the globally average surface temperature. Guess what? For low value of mu, the system will be is bistable, remember, but is preferentially here. And for large value of mu, it's preferentially in the warm state. This is very unsurprising. Now, I reduce the noise, and what I start to see is that the PDF, as the theory indicates, the large deviation low structure indicates, concentrates here for low value of mu, and there for high value, large value of mu. Now, even weaker noise, and what we see is that the transitional region becomes smaller. In fact, what we can establish is that for mu, for a value of mu which is about 1.005, we have a first order phase transition for our system. So if we, if we, if we switch off the noise, we will have that all the measure is on the warm state for mu larger than this mu crate, and all the measure is on the cold state here. So we have literally a phase transition which is similar, but it's a non-equilibrium phase transition which is similar to a transition between liquid and gas for water, okay? So that's, so you can construct this. The final thing I want to say is that if you now choose different lo noise laws to the same problem, you will have different instantons, but you will have that the instantons correct, connect the same attractors to the same edge state. So this is, we propose as a different way, in, in, it's a stochastic based way to construct the attractor by looking where this line intersect, at least in a projected space. So there is another way to construct the edge state using instantons constructed with different noise laws. So coming to the conclusions, I, I hope I convinced you that uh, this research area has the potential for using a lot of fascinating concept in mathematics, and that if we believe a bit in the, in the fact that such mathematical structures persist, we are able to draw more general conclusion on those problems and see how the case of smooth response of climate system to perturbation joins on with the, the regimes where the smooth response is lost as a result of the, uh, of the shrinkage of the spectral gap of the transfer operator, and then using a different, of course, piece of mathematics, we can study this critical transition in a way that doesn't take too much approximations. Thank you very much.